Hi, Ken. Hi. I'm Eric from Australia. Hi. Uh, admire your work greatly, and it's really moved me in my life. Thank you. Um, yeah, I've just got an interesting question for myself. Um, actually, for you, but from my myself. <laughs> uh, last year, I gave my old Japanese Zen master uh, ayahuasca for his 69th birthday. There you go. <laughs> One of his students also took it with us. And did you, did you the, take it too? I took it too, yeah. There you go, boy. And I've just, just come from the Amazon from a crazy sort of shamanistic Christian religion that's, that's growing in Brazil at the moment. You've got quite a, quite a uh, path here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very interesting. Yeah. Um, anyway... At the end of the session, the, the young monk was, was very upset because he felt that he'd broken his precept of not taking drugs. Yeah. And he asked my teacher and our, our teacher, what was that? Was that a drug? Yeah. And my, my very humble Japanese teacher said, ah, oh, I think it was a food. <laughs> <laughs> yes, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> and, and, and usually he just enjoys beer and, but, and nothing else, and that was the first thing he'd ever had of a psychedelic you know, uh, nature. Anyway, um, what I wanted to ask is, what is I haven't re really heard you discuss yeah. the place of entheogens or what was known as psychedelics or power sure. plants. In transformative practice, do you feel they have a place for me in my own life? I, I'm a long-term meditator, but I've found certain peak experiences actually using meditation with ayahuasca or mushrooms yeah. to be extremely powerful yeah. and have helped me a lot and actually have taken me. Actually, your work has verified a lot of things that I've sure. experienced in those states. Yeah. And particularly, I like to acknowledge the sort of mysticism of South America as well and what that's yeah. offered the world and Central yeah. America. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, could you discuss sure. antigens at all? Thank you. Um, I've tended not to write very much about it because I don't have a lot of experience myself. And I don't know how or why that's so. I mean, as a boomer, it's sort of genetically the case that by the time you're, you're 22, you have to have tried eight psychedelics. By the time you're 28, you have to have tried 12. And if not, they, you can be arrested. <laughs> and so what I have noticed is that there are um, but I, I, I've watched this for a very long time, and, and it, it, there are a couple of a kind of fundamental constants that kind of keep reoccurring. One is that um, people that use psychedelics and some form of spiritual practice, meditation or something like that, get an enormous a, a bit out of them. And I think that's because uh, in the meditative states they have some sort of uh, um, comparison that they can contrast it, they can get a sense about it. They have been introduced to states that are you know, deeper than the ordinary egoic state. So when they're introduced to something like ayahuasca or something, it's not their first experience, they're not totally taken or blown away by it. They don't overread it. But at the same time, you, it's clearly the case, as, as far as I can tell, that um, the, the people that do that get experiences like you're talking about that you just can't quite get sitting on a meditation mat. Um, and some of them use it very, very, very positively. And, and I think that um, it's a case that in very judicious uses, uh, some people using both uh, do better than people using either alone. And, and, and it's sort of a generic thing that I, so the more altered states you experience, the more it can help you transform. Um, so I, I, think, I, think that's, I think that's fine, and I think that, that's true. The, the, um, the downside comes with people that only use uh, psychedelics or drugs. And, and I found that over the years, they just become mean. It, it somehow, it just kind of closes them down. It's like you, you keep doing it, and you keep doing it, and you keep doing it, and it doesn't quite cause the transformation. It can cause a peak experience but generally not a transformative experience. And some people, like David Data, will say that in order for altered changes of state to contribute to transformation, permanent transformation, it has to be basically endogenous, not exogenous. It has to be, has your own source to do that. Um, uh, the, the people that do use both and use it as a sacrament, I think an enormous bit out of it. And there's, there's one profound way, in sort of an absolute sense, that, that you can use uh, psychedelics. And that is, particularly 
first of all, it introduces you to certain subtle states. But then by subtraction, it introduces you, it can help you see that ever-present causal state, that ever-present non-dual state. Because fundamentally, the, the, the more you go into things like big mind, the more you go into the ever-present state, the more you realize it's not an experience. It doesn't have a beginning in time. And anything that has a beginning in time is not real. We're talking for the absolute state. So you might have been in introduced to big mind. And because there was an experiential component to it, big mind itself didn't have an experiential component. What you were experiencing is the ego going, ah, you know, for finally, a <laughs> vacation from me. <laughs> And so you're experiencing all of the gross and subtle as you do that. The more you do it, the more you realize that big mind is the only thing you've ever known. For a billion years, you have only known this noticing, witnessing awareness. There's never a time you can think of when you weren't you. And so the more you deepen that ever-present recognition, the more you realize that whatever is an experience is not it. And one of the ways uh, one of my teachers used to handle this is people would come in, and this is uh, uh, um, Chaga Tolku, who is my root guru in Dzogchen, and people would come in and go, oh, I finally got it, this luminosity and this absolute clarity is amazing. It's like, how can I miss this? It's so great. And he would go, did that have a beginning in time? You go, yeah, yesterday afternoon. And it's like, yeah, and I'm sitting there. And he says, that's not it. Anything that has a beginning in time is temporal. Anything that has a beginning in time has an end in time. And if you equate God with a state like that, then when that state slips, that God slips with it. But what is the witness of that state? It doesn't have a beginning. And so I've actually seen... Uh, people that shall go nameless, the Sam Burkholz in the region, and they were actually doing psychedelics. And the teacher was basically saying, and this is an intense case of it, are you distracted by these phenomenal displays, extraordinary experiences? Can you find that that is not an experience? What part of that doesn't have a beginning? That part is the unborn. That part is what is real. That part is what will stay with you when the fireworks come and go, and they will all come and go. And that's the nature of phenomenal objects. As I say, they come, they stay a bit, they torture you, and they leave. Hmm. Every object you can think of will do that to an extent. And if, you, if it's a painful object, it will torture you while it's there. If it's an object you love, it will torture you when it dies. The only thing that is free of that is the witness. The only thing that's free of that is yourself. The only thing that's free of that is that ever-present I amness. Before Abraham was, I am. Every sentient being can say that. And so this sort of negative lesson for this, so the advanced course is to take this stuff and notice it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And there's something that doesn't about that. And the more you accustom yourself to just what you're feeling right now, the more you accustom yourself to that in you which is noticing everything. There's something in you which is conscious of everything all the time. 